Andy Johnson. This is a short presentation, well, not very short, on recognizing and identifying words. A lot of the ideas are taken from my books. You can see them right there. First of all, tip number one, when reading, stop correcting the mistakes when your child is reading out loud. Why? Well, first of all, reading is not correctly identifying the words. Reading is creating meaning with print. As long as the child is creating meaning with print, why mess with them? I know this is hard to do. You want to jump right in there, but the child sometimes begins to flinch when you correct every word. Teach a child to say blank and keep moving on. You will notice that when you stop and try to process every letter, it takes a little bit longer, fills up more cognitive space, if they say blank and move on, most often they're able to find clues within a microsecond and go back and make the self-correction. It takes far less space, far less time, and it focuses on creating meaning with print. As well, if you jump in and correct the mistakes, you deprive the child of the opportunity to develop metacognition, thinking about thinking. Does it make sense? Children need to stop after every sentence and say, does it make sense? You will see a lot of self-corrections. Once you stop correcting mistakes, the child will go back and then make the corrections. What if the student stops and asks for help? We'll say, well, what makes sense? Give it your best guess and move on. Or do you see some clues on either side? And we'll talk more about this, but that's tip number one. Never say, sound it out. It's like the child didn't think of that. Well, sound it out. Well, I know that. I've tried to do that. I just can't do it. It gets the focus on letters versus creating meaning. It slows them down and they're already trying to sound it out. They just can't do it very well. So three important ideas. First, reading is not sounding out words. We treat it as it is, as it were. It's creating meaning with print. Readers use what's in their head to make sense of what's on the page. Ten times more information flows from the cortex down than from the page up during the process of meeting, uh, making meaning during the process of reading. And the third big idea is the brain uses Three cueing systems to cue the brain is to what to cue the brain as to what that word is to recognize words during reading. And these are various systems of the brain working together, and you see them. Input data from the page comes to the relay station, the thalamus. The three cueing systems, then the information goes up to the cortex. But as I said, more information is flowing down. We use semantics, which is meaning, which is the context of the sentence. That's a powerful way to recognize words. We do that. Syntax, which is grammar, or word order, or sentence structure, tense plurality, and phonics. Of the three, phonics is the least efficient. It takes up the most time and the most space in working memory. Doesn't mean we shouldn't teach phonics. It means we should include activities to develop all three cueing systems. Now, two commonly misused terms. Word recognition is different from word identification. Word recognition is what you're probably doing with the words on the page. You automatically you know what it is. You instantly see it. You learn to recognize word parts. You use the three cueing systems. You did not have to process each individual letter. That is word recognition. It is a skill. You do it automatically without thinking. Word identification is a strategy. Strategies must be consciously employed. Hmm, I don't know what that word is. I think I need to use a strategy. And you'll use one of these strategies. The goal, however, is to teach the strategy to develop the skill. And I'll say this again, but we do this so you can begin to do it automatically so it becomes a skill. We teach the process to develop the skill. So let's look at some word work, some word identification strategies first.
then we'll get to word recognition. Again, you have to consciously employ these when you see a word that isn't recognized. We teach these strategies so that they become automatic. You teach the strategy to develop the skill, automaticity. So we're going to look at these. The first is analogy. Boys and girls, here's the steps, and I'm teaching this using direct instruction. Look at the words. Look for parts you know. Use the parts to make a guess. Reread the sentence to teach the guess. You will teach these steps directly and explicitly how to do this. And this is what we call large unit phonics when you're looking for patterns and parts. I like to focus on the uh, 30 most uh, common phonograms or letter patterns or word families starting from here. These are the most common word families or phonograms. And I like to focus instruction on these and you'll see a little bit more. Now, more phemic analysis, when you hear that, you should think prefix, suffix, root words. We use these to see if we can identify words we do not know. Morphemic analysis, though, that's a little complicated. I like to call it prefix suffix. Boys and girls, we're going to look at prefix suffix. What you do if you see a word that you don't recognize, you look at it, look for prefix suffixes or roots you might know, make a guess based on your clues, and then reread the sentence to test your guess. And I'm teaching those four steps explicitly, teach the strategy to develop the skill, and I'm using cognitive modeling. I'm thinking out loud. Hmm, boys and girls, I see this where I'm not quite sure what it is, but here's a prefix I recognize. I'm going to make a guess based on that and some clues. All right? Cognitive modeling, thinking out loud. And context clues. Read the sentence, say blank for the word. Look for clues on either side of the word. Make a guess. Reread to test the guess context clues. This is the most powerful one. And I teach my students, if you see a word, say blank, skip it, and let your eyes look for clues on both sides of the words. And we do a lot of these quick, simple ones. Hmm, it's a mess. I need to blank my room. Mess, need to do something, so it's a verb or an action, and it's in the room. Hmm, I wonder what it is. And then we write students' guesses right there. And then I need to blank my room. And that's a pretty easy one. I'll show you a different one later. But that's how we teach context clues. Look for clues, stay blank, let your eyes skip on both sides, make a guess. And then phonics, which is the least efficient. And we all know how to do this. Put the letters together, create a, et cetera, et cetera. OK? So we need to teach the four strategies explicitly, direct instruction, the elements of effective instruction. You give some input, guided practice, you do it together, slowly diminishing the scaffolding or structure, independent practice, and with any skill. You cannot assume mastery. You go back, you revisit, you review throughout the year. We teach the strategy to develop the skill. We want to avoid this Humpty Dumpty in approach to reading instruction. This is this idea, this silly idea that we create readers by putting all the little pieces together, back together again, as all the king's horses and all the king's men tried to do. Here's the Humpty Dumpty in approach to reading instruction. We teach the little parts going in this order, one little skill at a time, and we go through it. And by the time they get to here, they put all the little pieces together, and they are readers. Magic. Now this, of course, is nonsense. Nonsense. This is not how the brain creates meaning with the print. With print. The brain recognizes patterns. That's what the brain is good at, recognizing patterns. Now there are three types of phonics instruction. Synthetic phonics, that's the type that we are most familiar with, putting the letters together to construct words. That's a traditional approach. Analytic phonics is analyzing the letters sounds in words that you know. Boys and girls, we read this. Can you find the word with the ch, -ch sound at the end? Boys and girls, there's a, a, a short A sound. Who can find that word? 
you're analyzing words that they know. And then large unit phonics using letter patterns to recognize and identify words. Which one should you use? All three of these. All three of these should be included in a reading program or reading instruction. So we're going to look at nine word recognition skills. And you see them right there. The first is word wall. This is a simple idea. Many of you are probably already doing it. Words on the walls. And you can have words according to letter patterns, phonograms, concepts. You can use this at all grade levels. You're limited only by your imagination. Now in the upper grades, you're also building vocabulary. Let me give you some examples. Words we commonly misspell. Words by topic or story. Or big words. You see them up there. They're on the wall someplace. Most frequent words. Or dosk words. Or xenocyte words. Or vowel sounds. They see them up there. They're on the wall. You use them for instruction. Teach them. Review. And, of course, the most common photograms, you could have them listed by word families. And you see short A, uh, here's some phonogram families, at in eight. Lots of things you could do with that. And semantic maps and diagrams. This, this is a type of word wall maybe you might want to use with third and fourth grade and up. You see the word in the context of a topic. Great for science and social studies. Pictures and diagrams. Here's some words on a wall. Letter patterns. These are sight words, most common words. Older grades. Science. Synonyms and associations. This is cool. They put a synonym or association. This is a way to expand the depth and breadth of word knowledge. And sight words, again, related to letter sounds. Using word walls, riddles, quick and easy. <clears throat> These are short, two to five minute. Uh, you ask a riddle. I'm thinking of a word. It's in the at family, and it is. Who can tell me what it is? And eventually, students will be able to ask riddles. And again, you're get th getting them to notice letter patterns on the wall. The brain naturally wants to see patterns. Here's one I do in a tutoring. This is quick and easy. I like to have it on PowerPoint so I can quickly move from one to the other. This is a uh, short A, not happy. And their eyes are processing through here looking for the not happy ones. Yes, sad. This is an older one, not the biggest. Turn to your neighbor, see if you can find. Yes, smallest. This is real simple. This should take three to six minutes at the most. To review the ill phonogram word family, same thing. They're looking at the words. They're noticing letter patterns. The ill used for cooking. Very quick, very quick. Three to six minutes to reinforce this sound. The third idea is a writing prop using the words on the word wall. Now these are five to ten minutes. Generate some ideas, <clears throat> get that draft or sloppy copy down, and then you share. That's the majority of your writing activities. You generate ideas, you write, and then you share with somebody. This is outside of a writing workshop, and that's another topic. You want to make these, use your teacher creativity and intelligence to connect to students' lives to the greatest extent possible. Tell me about a time when you felt mad, or when you felt glad and then they describe right 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 share writing prompts what do you think about you want students authentic writing is where students write from within themselves describing their experiences their observations their ideas that's authentic writing word sorts are great uh, for large unit phonics to get them to notice letters and letter patterns. Ideally, this is done in pairs or small groups. Give them a group of words. They have to put them in groups related to letter patterns. And I like pairs and small groups because it gets them talking, gets them noticing. And it's easy to make this multi-level simply by including different words with different groups and uh, <clears throat> different types of words. You can also have them grouped according to meaning, vocabulary, or concept. This is a group of hard things. This is a group of animal things. 
limited only by your imagination in word sorts of various kinds. With young children, I like to have the actual cards written out so they're physically manipulating. With older students, they can have these on lists and they can move them around either on paper or on the computer or some such thing. Shared reading for large unit phonics. Oh, this is a good one. The teacher reads the book or the text to the students or with the students. They can all see it. And then the next day, students read the text independently with a partner or a buddy. So they've already read it. As they are reading, they are identifying interesting or important words from the selection. Words found in context. You want a total of, from the whole class, 10 to 25 words. So depending, each group could find three or five or two, however you choose to do it. The teacher then records the words on a board or a screen or a list. With younger students, the teacher actually makes three by five cards with those words on it. So this is done the next day, usually. Older students, you can simply have the list on a screen or a sheet of paper or whatever. Then you ask the students to create groups based on letter patterns or meaning or both. And they can do a couple of them. They can change partners, make new groups, uh, limited only by your imagination. The important thing is that they are noticing patterns. They're developing the neural cognitive networks begin to recognize patterns. And then you can create posters with the name of the book or the reading and put them on the wall with young kids. They actually paste the cards in groups on a large sheet of butcher paper and you can have pictures and diagrams or however you choose to do it. But again, they are seeing the words in context again. This is a great idea. Word building comes in a variety of forms. Still, uh, students are building words using onsets, which are the beginning, and rhymes, which are the, the essential word family. And again, the goal is pattern recognition, automaticity, so they begin to automatically recognize words with the pattern. Different ways, you can add the letter to different phonograms. M, app, m, add, m, app. You can add different letters to the same phonogram. B, at, at. However you choose to do this, you can use Scrabble, uh, little letter kinds of things, however you choose to do it. When I'm working online with a student, B plus add is, and we go through these real quickly, B plus add is good. And again, three to five minutes here every day so they are noticing the add letter patterns. That is the goal, to notice it. With older students, I just want them to see parts of word. N plus app plus in. Yes, napping. B plus ack plus d. Backed. A, a. And I'm reinforcing the short A sound at the same time. Dictated sentences. Oh, this is a lovely one. And it can also be used to develop sentence structure and grammar, which is the syntactic cueing system. And you can reinforce all these things at the same time. This is how you do it. This could be used with second grade through graduate school. You dictate a short sentence or a longer sentence for older students, and you include the target words, one or two of the target words. If you are focusing on the short A sound or a phonogram or word family, you include one of those words in the, in the sentence. Tell students to don't worry about the spelling. After each sentence, students are asked to underline a word that doesn't look right, and they can usually find the misspelled word. Then you show the complete sentence with the correct spelling, and they can show that either on a poster or flip over a card or on a screen. If they're working with a buddy, the partner shows them the sentence. You have them cross out the incorrect word and write the correct spelling on top so they can see the differences. And one to three sentences, students reread until fluency is achieved. And you can save these sentences to practice reading if you wish. Sentence dictation. It gets them noticing letter sounds and patterns. By the way, spelling lists, weekly spelling lists, do very little to actually get these words into students' authentic writing to be able to write and spell under game conditions. But we continue to do it, and that's the topic of another uh, uh, 
video. You want to try to make the sentences relevant to students' lives if you can. I like to sit pop, and here I am reinforcing the ip ip uh, phonogram. Here's an example. It is bad. These are the very short ones I maybe would do with struggling readers in the second grade or so. Keep it short, keep it simple. Learning occurs over time. You don't learn by mastering a worksheet. You learn over time by recognizing letter patterns and sounds and words. <clears throat> Sentence replay or replay analysis. This is a form of retroactive miscue analysis uh, used to develop all these things. You can see them right there, letter patterns, sight words, metacognition. Here's how you do it. Students are given either three to six sentences on a sheet of paper. They reread these sentences into an audio recorder. Students listen to the recording. They underline the stumble words or the trouble words. And they can do this with a teacher or a buddy. Go back and reread until fluency is achieved. And sometimes you can have them record it the second time. Uh, you say they uh, achieve fluency after two times or so. Use with older struggling readers as well because they're able to analyze the types of mistakes that they use. And this is a great activity for a learning center. This is called sentence replay or replay analysis. Start with three to six. Again, you can have sentences that reinforce target words. Always adopt and adapt with everything. You can work in pair. One person could be the recorder operator and help identify stumble words, and then you switch roles. So you can adopt and adapt, use this in a wide variety of ways. Maze and Close, it has a sentence with a target word, either missing or choices, and the choice should be abundantly obvious. I had a b dream. It's used to develop the semantic cueing system, to use context clues. I have students say blank. I had a blank dream. So it gets them to use clues on both sides of the words. This should be six to 12 uh, of these, four to eight minutes a day. And again, you can have target words, or you can have words from the word wall, or letter patterns, or topics, or life events, or maybe after a story, you have sentences, maze, and clothes related to the story. And I teach students, again, if you see a word you don't know, say blank, and move on, look for clues. For example, the monster blank under the bridge. It was a monster hmm, bridge and it was under it. And then I have them list some clues. What do you think that word might mean? And it could be a whole bunch of them. And then I might give maybe the first letter clue, the monster what under the bridge. Hmm. What, what could it be? The monster waited under the bridge. Yes, waited, waited. And they'll see that a lot of their words fit as well. And here's an example of the type I do online. I move quickly. I like to use a PowerPoint of sorts. I had a blank dream and it saves them. Yes, and it's abundantly obvious. I had a blank dream. And I'm reinforcing the short A sound. Now here is a May sentence. Brad had a blank day at school. And they're having to notice each one to find the correct one. And they're using context. They're creating meaning. They're not just responding to single words out of context. Here's a higher level one. Sally clapped her blank after the show. Adam added two blank salt to the meal he was cooking. Yes, here's the thing about focusing overly much on letter sounds. Ah, 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 that short A, but salt, oh, 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 and was, oh, oh. It's not always very reliable, these letter sounds and rules and stuff. Edward was napping in the back blank of the car. You get the example. These are quick, three to eight minutes. And the last thing, some ideas for writing for word work. Writing is great for developing the syntactic cueing system, grammar, syntax, word order. Simplest one, language experience, activity, you have an experience, and you write about it. They dictate to you. And depending on the age, first and second grade, a minimum of two sentences. Third grade and older, five sentences. And you can do this individually. 
or in groups. When I'm working individually, I love to do it because it helps me make connection with that student. And then this is an actual one. And then they reread this story, and we call them stories, until fluency is achieved. All right. So you're having that experience. Small group would be done, done the same way, write it on a board or a computer. Get to see this. Analytic phonics is looking at this and then you analyze words. Eh, eh, eh. There's a short E word here. Yesterday, good. There's a word that ends with the D, D, played. You get the idea. You're analyzing words that are in their vocabulary, their experience. Save it on a Word document. I like this because you can reread them. Maybe at the end of the week, we reread the ones, stories we did in two, Monday through Thursday. And students can send you pictures. You can take pictures. They can include pictures as well. This is Paris the dog, and she wrote about her dog, Paris, and it was wonderful. And when we went back, she had that picture, and she could read, practice reading using words and experiences that she has had. Sentence mix-up, again, it's a form of writing. Use, it can be used as a post-reading activity if the sentences come from the story. You can reinforce letter patterns, and here's how you do it. Here's one way. Here's how I do it online. Ideally, they'd be given word cards, mix them up, and they put them in the right order. When I'm working one-on-one -on, -one on a computer, I want to do it quickly, tell me when you know what the sentence is. And usually right about here, plants grow in a garden. And with younger students, I always give uh, capital letter clues so they know that's the beginning of the sentence. I'm subtly teaching sentences begin with a capital letter. All right. Here I am reinforcing the short A sound. First grade, so I'm using a period clue as well. Tell me when you know what the sentence is. is. And usually the cat ran away. Very quick, can be used as a post-reading activity or to reinforce letter sounds or patterns. Three to six minutes of these. Facilitated writing. Here you generate ideas to create a word bank and you write the words on the board or screen, depending if you're doing it in large group or individually, and you're giving, creating a word bank for the student to use. For example, favorite thing to do, Sally was writing about swimming. I had her tell me what she wanted to talk about that day or tell me some things she wanted to say about swimming. And as she did, I was writing down the big words that she was telling me. So she has a word bank, so she only has to use the little words to create sentences and ideas. So they're speaking what they want to say before they say it. And the last idea is called priming pictures. Show students a picture or image. Ask them, what's going on here? What do you want to say? Describe what's happening. And they can write on a journal or paper on a computer. I like computers because you can get these pictures right on the computer and they can have their sentences right underneath it. Now, when I look for pictures, I can actually get out and take pictures of students or of the community. Or I can look online and find pictures of kids about the same age, maybe a little bit older. They're more interested in those. Struggling writers might need to dictate to you as you write on the screen, but they always reread until fluency is achieved, save and date it, and they can use this for reading practice and analytic phonics on later dates. All right, some ideas, recognizing and identifying words.